Hi everyone! This is my in-depth look at Electric Light Orchestra's song called Livin' Thing. And it's my first time listening. Having listened to Electric Light Orchestra is the first song I'm digging into of theirs. And so many of you have been urging me to check out Electric Light Orchestra. This was an interesting experience listening to this song for the first time and then exploring the music more thoroughly in preparation for this in-depth video. You are right. There are certainly things about it that feel natural and native to me. This can cut two ways. On the one hand, it certainly does make it easier to relate to the music on the very first few exposures. On the other hand, Listening to it multiple times over the past few days, I noticed that as I became familiar with this piece, it became less and less engaging to me. And when I sat down to unravel why I was having this reaction, this experience, I realized that precisely because of the things about it that appealed to me, I had begun holding it to a different standard. I was subconsciously demanding it fill a role that it was never meant to fill. You see, when I listen to or play an orchestral style piece of music with all the wonderful interplay of parts and instruments, I typically expect to be dealing with something that is really quite deep and complex and artistically highly developed, something I can really sink my teeth into in multiple ways for a long time. And so I instinctively began to look for the same kind of experience from this song. Remember when I first heard it, I said that the flamboyant violin in the int introduction reminded me of something along the lines of Paganini, but it could even be Pablo de Sarasate. And just in case you really love that part of the piece and want to see what I mean by something to really sink into, here are two links. The first is to a short and rather famous piece by Sarasate. And the second is Paganini's first violin concerto. They're both really great pieces and I hope that you enjoy them. Now, it's not a bad thing to have high artistic standards, but it's also not a bad thing to cross-pollinate different types of art with the same mediums. And so it is unfair to compare one kind of expression with a totally different type and then complain about the fact that the first one doesn't accomplish what the second one does. And so when I realized what was happening, I sat back and reassessed my developing feelings about this song. I recalibrated my expectations and my conclusion is that as long as we are clear about what this song is, not only what it isn't, it's a perfectly fine song with some very nice features. So first of all, what this song is. It's a song written in a very popular, what I would call modern style. Depending on what I'm judging about it, there are certain things that I would describe as commercial, but I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit. It is very nicely orchestrated. And again, I'll explain what I mean by that term in a few minutes as well. And in spite of all the orchestral instrumentation and what many might want to call a classical sound, it successfully avoids the baggage of being stuffy, outdated, overly intellectual, or sonically irrelevant that often comes along with traditional classical music 
thereby remaining not only accessible but also highly appealing to a broad audience. It also genuinely possesses musical flair, style, personality. You can feel as the first notes begin, it makes you want to sit up and take notice. It grabs your attention with its dynamism. Like someone with a strong and attractive charisma walking into a room. And yet, when we sit down and really get to know this person, we find that they are quite simple and perfectly comfortable in ordinary circumstances. We could say down to earth every day. Not someone that makes us feel like we have to be always interesting and sharp, rather more like a favorite uncle who can be engaging in a crowd, but he's perfectly cool to just sit and watch TV with after everyone is gone. Turns out he's not a philosopher or helicopter pilot or mountain climber. He actually works as, uh, let's say, a nurse. Nothing profoundly out of the ordinary, but such a nice guy with a clearly defined personality. You always enjoy your time hanging out with him. Now, whatever does this have to do with the music? Well, it's simply my attempt to paint a non-technical picture of what we may find so appealing about this song. Now let's get bold and break the music down into the three main musical components so that we can take a closer look. The three primary elements of music are melody, rhythm, and harmony. Let's start with the first one and work our way through all three. In this song, the melody follows a very basic contour, primarily walking up and down the scale. And it comes in short bits. Very often in sung music, Four bars is the standard length per phrase. Here, it starts with just three bars. And here's, here's what that is. That's all there is to it. And each little phrase or melodic segment happens twice in a row. Not an exact repetition the second time, but very close. And the phrases get even shorter. For example, this one comes not long after. That's almost, that's almost its own melodic segment. Well, it kind of is extended into something that follows. Okay, we could say that those two go together. But there's such a large gap between them, we experience them separately. And that's pretty much all there is to the verse. It's almost like a little nursery rhyme in its brevity. Then the chorus. Listen to how the melodic material here is also incredibly minute. It's pretty much all there is. It repeats. But that's all there is, material-wise. So we don't have a lot of content, mel melody-wise, except in the solo violin lines. This is where the most substantive melody shows up. And it's interesting to me to notice that the actual sung part of the song, based on the things that I just played, those small little sound clips, <clears throat> where we might expect to find significant thought and effort put into the melody so that it carries and illuminates the lyrics, is actually treated more like a Shall I say a viola part? Well, that's pushing towards the ever popular viola jokes that violinists love to throw at their long-suffering colleagues, but 
when you place these two parts, the violin that we hear in the intro and interlude and all of that, and the voice parts side by side, we do see that there's a vast difference in the level of musical interest and sophistication. It's as if the vocal part is merely an accompaniment, a harmonic and tonal filler within the larger context of the music. Rhythmically also, we find a relatively simple design. It's primarily marking every full beat throughout and secondarily dividing some of those beats into halves. Sometimes we are pointed to both halves in sequence, while other times we are pointed to one or the other half more strongly, so that we have a bit of basic syncopation. And when we listen to the drums, we find that they are sticking with a simple repeated rhythm throughout most of the song too. While this can be perceived as boring, it is also the musical feature that gives the melody any hope of being noticed, because a good portion of the melody does fall on the syncopated halves of the beats. In other words, keeping the instruments primarily on the beats allows for there to be space between the beats where the melody can stand out and be noticed. Now we get to the last element in our list, harmony. This song uses a very simple, very basic harmonic structure, very much in the form of a song. Intro, verse, chorus, interlude, verse, chorus, interlude, verse, chorus, coda. Now, I went through the entire score, which is 32 pages long, and I wrote down every single chord along the way. And I want to show you how it looks. This single page is the sum total of the complete harmonic structure of the whole piece. And supposing I found myself at a harp on stage with the electric light orchestra, I could set this single page on my music stand just exactly as it is and have everything, absolutely everything I need, musically, information wise, to play along and improvise a complete harp part that would fit with this song. an instant on-the-spot participant. No advanced practice or preparation really necessary. Well, that's the advantage of knowing music theory. And if you want to be able to do it yourself, check out my Patreon and Coffee memberships because I am presenting a music theory course just especially for anyone who wants to learn to do this kind of thing and much more. But as we look closer at this page, we start to notice that it could be reduced even more. For example, we have something called the intro, and if we skip ahead, we see interlude, and another interlude, and then we have coda. And comparing those, we see that they are pretty much identical. Well, there are some slight variations. If we look at the interlude, both interludes, um, we see that the first line here is the same set of chords. The second line, we have this F rather than the C's here. Now, that means that there are some variants along the way in this song to keep it from being boring. But we don't have any particularly new chords showing up. If we now look at the verse, which is what I played on the harp, 
this first verse here, we have four bars of C. Then we have A flat for two bars and then F minor for two bars. Then we have E minor, D minor, E minor, and, and so it goes. Looking at this next verse, again, there's a slight variant because rather than four bars of C at the beginning, we have A minor for a couple bars. So it does give us just enough variety so that we don't get bored. While at the same time, it's mostly the same. And verse three is exactly the same as verse two, except we miss this F chord right here. What I'm trying to show you is that this is a very simple harmonic structure with a very simple repetitive pattern tweaked a little bit so that we don't just feel like we're doing the same thing over and over and over again. But we could break this up and we could say that mainly these three are the same and the choruses are mainly the same. And then we could say that the coda, the interlude, and intro are mainly the same. We can get nitpicky and say, oh, there's a different chord there, a different chord there, but, but overall, that's what we have, which means, well, I have three colors on my page here. I have mainly, let me pick one more color just because color is wonderful, mainly this much encompasses the whole song. So once we've unraveled it this far, we realize that in reality, the nuts and bolts of this song are very, very basic. Very simple, very repetitive. Just like, for example, a folk song such as The Water is Wide or something like Shenandoah. Essentially, the composer of Living Thing has written a modern style we could say folk song. It's a simple tune with a simple rhythm supported by a simple chord structure. And that's why it's so easy to fall into it, to feel yourself carried along with the current because it's something that even a very elementary music hobbyist can play in its reduced form. In other words, it's very accessible extremely approachable. And that's what I was getting at when I said earlier, commercial. It's the same basic material that people use when they want to create something that appeals and sells to the widest possible audience. But then, then we have the orchestration. And that is what makes it feel like so very much more. I'm going to include two links to some old traditional Welsh folk songs, which are also very simple in many of the same ways that this song is, but which have been orchestrated and arranged for a baritone singer. I don't know what you'll think of his voice. He's too operatic for some ears and that's okay, but try to listen to what the orchestra contributes to the music when you listen to these links, because that's what I want you to understand about Live and Thing. It's not about some genius novel or even particularly outstanding music composition, but it's the orchestration that makes it sound so colorful. Just like in the live stage colors of that performance that holds our attention. And this is a very special skill. It might seem simple at first, but a good orchestrator is not merely dividing and assigning parts according to what makes good musical sense, but he or she is also making creative, artistic decisions all along the way. Remember how I was enjoying the little moments when the trumpet popped in? or the sweeping passages played by the violins, or the chorus in the background. Now, imagine that the violin passages were played by, okay, let's say 
the trumpets and the violins traded parts. It would sound completely different and not very well balanced. And so you can understand that the musical appeal of this song is because of the well-designed arrangement and orchestration. Who plays which part and when? That is what makes us want to listen to it. That is why we feel like it's more than just a little verse and chorus repeated several times. Now, one of my patrons who had access to hear the first listen ahead of time commented and told me some more information that the chorus that we hear in this song is actually the thousands of fans in the audience singing along. They know this song, they are participating, and that was picked up in the live recording of this concert. And it's another, it's another illustration of how when you create something that is very beautiful and yet accessible, it has this wonderful effect of giving everybody a richer experience. In that respect, Electric Light Orchestra does an excellent job of, we could say, elevating this simple, ordinary, even potentially boring tune to something that becomes a full experience in itself. Is it deeply profound music? I wouldn't say so, but it's not pretending to be such. If that's what you're looking for, you have to go somewhere else. But if you want nice, easy, enjoyable listening with even a potential um, social collaborative element with a lush and pleasing orchestral quality, this is a good choice. So that's it. But before I go, here's a quick reminder of the poll which is running now in the community. Led Zeppelin is ahead of Rush with, by 8% now. So I'm not sure if there's enough time to change the balance, but who knows? Do remember, though, to write your song of choice in the comments after you vote. But, 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 but pay attention. Vlad doesn't count the comments, which include more than the artist's name and the song's name, because it's too much to wade through a lot of verbiage. And if you didn't watch my first listen of Electric Light Orchestra, Living Thing, you have here on the screen the link to go straight to it. Enjoy. I'll see you next time.